Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our 29 Federal Election Forum. My name is Naomi Larson, and I'm with the Chetwin Chamber of Commerce. I'm the Executive Director. Thank you, everybody, for coming here tonight. For a little while there, we were like, it was pretty empty. So thank you all for filling the seats. <laughs> so we will start over here, and you can just answer. And so we're not going to do our... our Okay. Okay, so we'll do our intro first. Okay. My my reason for running for the Liberal Party is because of all the work that the Liberals have done in the last four years. In this fall's important election, Canadians will be will have a clear choice. While Conservatives want to go backward with divisive politics and cuts to vital services that families rely on. The Liberals are focused on moving forward with our positive plan to invest in growing the middle class and raising people out of poverty and ending poverty in all forms throughout Canada. This October, let's choose forward for everyone. The Conservatives like to say they're for the people, but then they cut taxes for the wealthy and cut services for everybody else. In October, we we have a choice to make. Keep moving forward and build on the progress we've made or go back to the politics of the Harper years. I'm for moving forward for everyone. The North needs a strong voice and representation in Ottawa. I can provide the North with that voice. My background is that I have a Bachelor of Arts degree in History, a Bachelor of Laws degree also from, both degrees are from UBC. And I also have a third degree, a Master of Laws from Harvard Law School. I work as a lawyer in Prince George and also as a consultant. I was born in Vanderhoof, BC, and I was raised in Fort St. James. I have lived my entire life in the North. And even when I was at university, I returned to Fort St. James the minute I wrote my last exam. I love the North, especially the long summer nights like nowhere else on earth. I love this country more than anything. My ancestors have been here since time immemorial. I am a carrier First Nation by birth, and I have four children and my husband and three grandsons. And the North has prov provided a vast amount of wealth and resources that we are not benefiting from. For instance, we do not have a rural public transportation system in the North. We, like in the lower mainland, I always like to bring up that they have public transit that consists of trains, boats, planes, and automobiles. And we don't even have a Greyhound bus system in the north right now. So there's safety becomes a huge issue when you're tra trying to travel from one community to the other. Today, <coughs> the middle class Canadians are working harder than ever before. But so many are worried that they won't have enough money for retirement. Fewer and fewer Canadians have workplace pensions to rely on. To address this, the Liberals have made commitments to Canadians to strengthen the CPP in order to help Canadians achieve their goal of a strong, secure and stable retirement. The Liberals also changed the retirement age back to 65 from 67 when Harper had changed it. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me here. My name is Catherine Kendall, and I'm a community development consultant. I've worked with the social services sector for the past 20 years, serving vulnerable children, families, children, and youth. I'm the executive director and the co-founder of Cannot Youth Center Society in Prince George. I have a strong background in local and regional agriculture. I have been the vice president of Eaglet Lake Farmers Institute for 11 years, director of District C, and director of Local Food Prince George. I've been educating people about our fragile and unsustainable food systems and about how our food systems have become local, need to become more localized and sustainable. Licensed under Health Canada in 1999 and 2000, I grew industrial hemp for oilseed production. I worked with many growers in the region and created a provincial hemp co-op. I see much potential in that particular area across the country. I worked in the field of environmental health, researching the effects of industrial landscape changes by forestry and mining activities in north central BC. I've seen the negative effects firsthand to air, water, wildlife, and humans. I'm a mother of six children with a deep concern for our children's future. 
The climate crisis is real, tangible, and imminent, and requires no further delay to respond. I chose to run as a Green Party candidate because of the Green Party's had the only vision for changing the status quo. It's time to vote for social and environmental accountability. It's time to vote for change. The Green Party platform highlights that I'd like to share are stopping fossil fuel subsidies, investing in renewable energy like geothermal and solar and wind, retrofitting all homes, retrofitting all homes to be energy efficient across Canada, investing in Canadians with no tuition and no cost pharmacare, Optimize road transportation and bus systems to reach and facilitate travel for our northern and most rural residents. Manage urban and cross-country railway systems to be more efficient for the transport of people and goods. Support young and elderly citizens with financial supports in the way of guaranteed livable income supplements. Provide clean drinking water to every citizen. We still don't have that. Invest in local agriculture. We all want healthy food. Reform the, flaw the flaws in the cannabis sale and production, increase hemp production. We do want to generate a profit in this country. It's called our GDP. Be transparent in all aspects of governance. This is also something we don't have yet. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. This is probably the most important election of our lifetimes. My name is Ron Valent, the People's Party of Canada candidate. And uh, a little bit about myself. I'm a tradesman, a journeyman carpenter from way back in my previous life. And uh, now I'm a journeyman pipe fitter. I actually gave up my very good paying uh, gas plant job to do this. It's costing me tens of thousands of dollars. I'm very concerned about what's going on with Canada. The People's Party of Canada is a new party started in September 14, 2018 by Maxime Bernier. He was with the Conservative Party for over a decade. He ran in the leadership race against Andrew Scheer. Uh, that night, actually, what witnesses say is that there were 7,446 extra votes cast in members, and uh, then they went to do a recount, but the ballots were shredded that night. He stayed on uh, for eight months after that, trying to get some of his party platform uh, to be used, and Andrew Scheer completely shut him down, so he had no voice and he had a choice to make. He just didn't want to go back into private life because he had grave concerns for Canada, just like we do. So he started the People's Party of Canada. It's taken off like a rocket ship. We have 320 candidates across Canada out of 338 ridings. All of them are just like myself, very concerned citizens. Many of us haven't been politically involved before. We're the only party that actually wants to have a balanced budget in two years. Now, Andrew Scheer, in the leadership race, he had promised up and down that he was going to do a two-year balanced budget. Now he says he has to do it in five years, and he blames it on, uh, on uh, Justin Trudeau. Uh, so even before the election is, is actually happening, he's broken his first election promise. So there you have the character of the type of person you're going to have, uh, you know, going, uh, running the CPC there. Uh, so after we go after the two-year budget, we're going to stop wasteful spending and we want to actually deal with the debt. Whoever talks about that, it's always just talking about the budget as if it is the debt. We want to lower taxes after that. Uh, so we're going to raise a basic personal exemption from 12,000 to 15 grand. It'll save $500. If you make 75,000, you're going to save two grand. 130, 40,000 income would be about $3,000. We want to get businesses going again, and we're going to have a flat tax of 10%. Uh, we're not going to have any capital gains tax, and we're not going to have any carbon tax. <clears throat> we want to make equalization fair across Canada. Alberta wants to separate, <clears throat> and they want to separate uh, largely on account of just even equalization. Uh, the Liberals and the Conservatives could have easily changed the formula to make it fair. Quebec doesn't have to count in their elect hydroelectricity in the formula. And the Western Canada is actually hurting greatly right now, and we're still spending, uh, sending billions of dollars over there. We're going to use 9210 of the Constitution to approve pipelines. If we, we, when we just say that the pipeline is in the national interest, then the federal government has total jurisdiction over everything in Canada and we're going to go ahead and use that. We're not going to go and do a 10-year energy corridor with no pipes in the ground after 10 years. We're going to secure our borders. We're going to lower immigration. Actually, what you need to do is check out our party platform. Go to peoplespartyofcanada.ca. Look at our party platform. It's a lot better than listening to me. And check out my YouTube channel. Very important videos there. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. I want to thank the candidates as well. I just wanted to address something that had happened at one of the recent debates. Uh, some very upsetting and rude comments were made to one of the candidates. And I just wanted to say that uh, there is no place for rude comments or disrespectful behavior at these debates. And it's already been said by, by Naomi already. And it's not fair to you in the room to say that to you. But I thought it just needed to be addressed uh, to all the candidates tonight. 
that uh, I respect them all for being here and, we, and uh, respect their opinions as well, even though we differ at times. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to say hi on a lighter note. We'll get into the more fun side of this of the debate, I guess. Uh, I've been proud to represent Chetwind over the last eight years. I remember coming out here back in 2010 initially as a, a nominee and meeting many of you then. And since then, I've been here as recent as uh, just a few months ago. Well, it seems like a few months ago, but it's almost a year with the caribou conversation and all the, the really the concerns around the caribou closures. And uh, really have done my best to represent you and to make sure that we have your interests at heart. Uh, we know that Chetwind is a resource-based economy. Uh, we know we, we need to re develop our resources, but do it responsibly from a federal perspective. And I think we're doing that. Um, I also want to talk about, we'll get into it a bit after the question started, I guess, about a five-point plan to get our forest industry back on its feet again. Uh, we know that some mills are still open. Uh, we know that here locally as well. But it's taken a big hit since we've uh, had a lack of a soft lumber agreement being, I think, the biggest cause why our forest industry is uh, taking such a hit. There's other factors, but uh, it being the, the prime reason. And I'll leave it at that. I know you have many questions to ask of us. I'd rather give you the time, but uh, thanks for your time and look forward to your questions again. All right. Sorry about the rough start. It's been a long week. All right. So um, one of the first questions we have <laughs> um, is, it's often challenging for business, especially small business, to provide required training to their workforce, particularly if they could lose them to another firm. If elected, what will be the economic priorities for your government to help small businesses grow sustainably across British Columbia? Thank you. The Liberal government has reduced the small business tax rate from 11% to 9%. And the government, Liberal government has also begun more than $180 billion in long overdue investments in transit roads and bridges that will help with the economic prosperity. They have also have the plan to strengthen the middle class and put more money into the middle class's pocket. And the Liberal team is moving ahead with making smart, necessary investments that will grow our economy. The Green Party platform has one key component to it that involves our youth. And so as our youth move into post-secondary education, those costs will be removed. And so as it stands right now, our children are coming out of colleges and universities with absorbent debts debts that they may not be able to pay for for 10, 20 years or more, and they, not, they don't usually get the, the position that they're hoping for as they get right out of school. So they may have to be working at McDonald's or Burger King or wherever it is that they may be working. And it's just, it's an overwhelming situation. And so be able to provide our small businesses with educated students that don't have a debt load would be a, an asset. Uh, People's Party of Canada is very energy sector, uh, resource sector, uh, you know, oriented. We want to be able to see these things flourish, and uh, we want to just basically get government out of the way. Government has actually been getting in the way with uh, various different bills that they've uh, brought forward. Uh, Bill C-69 is a, a real killer for that. Uh, that's, you know, uh, you almost have to jump over the moon in order to be able to get a project approved now. And um, actually, I was just talking to a fellow recently, and he was working on this uh, pipeline here, the LNG pipeline, and, and they have environmentalists in front of there looking for frogs and everything else. And they had to go and they spray wash their, their machine for six hours to make sure there's no dirt and debris on there. They went there and it was rejected by the environmentalists. Then they had to go and back and take the tracks off the thing in order to be able to clean it up. And they went back and they got approved. Then they went and worked and the guys were looking for frogs and everything else like that and they finally gave up. They said, we can't go ahead, we're losing too much money because it bit it by the area. So they went back and then they got called back a week later. They didn't even take the thing off of the trailer. They brought it back and it was rejected even though they spray washed it, you know, for, for three hours. And it was the same dirt that came from that same p facility, you know. So this is the kind of nonsense that's going on. We just basically want to get out of the way and, and make it so that uh, people can go and develop 
We want to be able to lower the business tax from 15% to 10%. And that's going to free up $9 billion of, of money to be able to be reinvested. We want to get rid of the capital gains tax by the end of the mandate, and that's going to free up another $7 billion. And so, uh, yeah, we're very resource-oriented, uh, and we want to be able to get things moving. Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I think uh, one of our key parts of our mandate for small businesses is to reduce regulations by 25%. And I know for some in the room it might not uh, resonate, but when you're a small business owner and you're being overwhelmed, inundated with regulations that even Ron referred to, uh, this government has put in place another 4,300 regulations since forming government in 2015. And you know what those are as small business owners, it's CRA, it's, it's many other issues that make it just much more difficult to operate your small business. I'll use an example from Dawson Creek. A young guy, well I consider myself young, I'm 50, uh, but a young business owner at 55 really should be building his business and he's hitting his stride right now but instead of building his business even further he actually just sh sold out and guess what his number one reason was to sell after a few years of talking to this person about it, I won't mention his name was being over regulated uh, regulated so much so that that was his business his main focus of the day was dealing with regulations and CRA issues so sadly, when that business should be growing bigger and bigger, have a good local business that's getting bigger and stronger, they're selling out because they're just uh, fed up with uh, too many regulations. So we're committed to changing that. A full 43% of all new job openings will require trades and technical training. While the Industry Training Authority has some success meeting this demand, with over 7,000 certifications of qualifications issued in 2017-2018, BC's completion rate is still only around 37% compared to 40% in other provinces. What is your plan for improving the apprenticeship model in British Columbia? Yeah, it's kind of... Uh it's a provincial question, but it's still, I think federally though, we still have a responsibility to address it. Um, I'll tell you from my perspective, I'm a Red Seal carpenter. So one of the things I did, I taught for seven years before I got this job and I taught trades. And one of the groups that we dealt with all the time was ITAC and the apprenticeship board, et cetera, trying to get more kids into trades, uh, get them more involved into trades because it's, first of all, a good way of life, it's a good income, uh, you can work and live at home. And uh, we were part of some significant training initiatives at the time in Vancouver to see more uh, even uh, female in trades. And now we're seeing lady welders, lady electricians a lot more than we used to. I think we need to do what we can to incentivize people to join the trades and I can speak from that firsthand. And I can speak from it secondhand. Because <laughs> I, I got two trades. I have a journeyman ticket uh, in carpentry and pipe fitting. And um, for me, what happened was, and actually, this is a provincial question, quite frankly. Uh, but because um, education is a provincial jurisdiction, and with the People's Party of Canada, we want to be able to respect the Constitution and get the federal government doing its business and the provincial government doing its. But uh, for me, actually, I went in, in high school. I knew I didn't want to go to university. So I went, and I, I went specifically, all the kids are going to go to one school, and I went on, quite a ways across town to go to a trade school. And 40 of my credits was in carpentry. From there, at the last uh, two weeks of school, I ended up going onto the job site, and I ended up starting my apprenticeship right then and there. And these are very successful uh, enterprises, and I think that this needs to happen. Uh, I don't know what the situation here in the school systems are here as far as you know, how far they've gone with this, but uh, it's, it's actually very vital. And um, so beyond that, basically, uh, I think the thing that we can do uh, on the federal level is to make it so that the businesses can flourish. If the businesses are, are, have a good bottom line and they're flourishing, they might want to go ahead, and I've been in businesses that do this, they'll go and spend some money in order to be able to help a person go and start their apprenticeship and get things going. The apprenticeship is there, it's just a matter of getting the people to do it. And if there's good, high quality jobs to, to go to, then, uh, then they're going to have the apprentices come. So that's going to be our role. The Canadian government will make decisions that are in the best interest of all Canadians. 
and back to the Green Party platform, the education will be at no cost. Certainly my son would definitely benefit to work into the trades. He definitely wants to be a heavy duty mechanic. And if there was no cost, I think he would be successful in that. The Liberal government is investing up to two million through the post-secondary institution strategic develop strategic investment fund to modernize the learning facilities of our universities, colleges, and poly polytechs. And they have also created more than 11,500 jobs in the auto industry and have also created six economic um, strategy tables chaired by the industry leaders. And this new model of industry government collaboration produced ambitious growth targets, identified challenges and bottlenecks, and laid out a roadmap to support innovation in six sectors. The work in the inside of the tables is reflected in the budget 2019. And now we'll do a question that was handed in to me earlier. What is going to happen with all of the voter cards that had been sent out to residents who are not Canadian citizens? Is there any truth to this? I'll start back. Sorry, could you repeat the question? There is how many voter cards? Yeah, I, I'm not aware of it, and so I don't know what w would happen to those voter cards. I'm not aware of uh, Canadian, non, you said non-Canadian citizens are getting voter cards that are being re returned? Yeah, no, I'm only aware of Canadian citizens that are actually being returned because they're going to homes that they don't live in anymore, and they're actually recycled after trying three times to find them. I read something about that recently, but I've had so much stuff go through my brain. <laughs> doing this campaign that I don't have it actually, uh, you know, detailed. But I knew, I know one thing that uh, was going on is they're talking about smudging. Uh, they're going and uh, somehow the, with the pencil, they're going and smudging off what they voted for and there's an issue with that. So if you're going to go ahead and, and do your X, make it, you know, like use a 2H pencil maybe or something, <laughs> something solid to make sure that your vote is counted. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, whoever submitted the question probably saw that on Facebook, right? I've seen the same post. I've actually had it given to me um, several times as well. It is concerning uh, that a non-citizen is getting a, a voter's card. Um, what I learned in, in my past experience as Member of Parliament is even Elections Canada, the voter list, the time that we looked at it, we were looking at it in committee, there was a 14% error rate in the voter's list. And the Election Canada boss at the time had said, somewhat discounted uh, my concerns about saying, well, 14% is a little alarming, don't you think? And uh, he seemed to think that we didn't have much to worry about. Um, I think there is. But that said, any, any incident that you know of personally, I think we've seen just the one example uh, go around the net. If you know of any other examples, please let us know and we'll report them to Elections Canada directly or report them directly to Elections Canada yourself. That's the best way we have to fix this. If you see an error, just report it. Thank you. All levels of government need to work together to prioritize trade enabling infrastructure investment. Prioritiz prioritization and coordination will help move goods that con contribute to economic growth, providing incentive for the private sector to make investments while contributing to local economies through the sustainable job growth and so to support local businesses. Would your government commit to a long-term transportation infrastructure projects in BC, such as the Taylor Bridge linking Fort St. John to Alberta, TransLink's Transport 2050 plan, and upgrading interior road infrastructure between Prince George and the North, only to name a few projects? Yeah, that's an easy answer to the question, absolutely. Uh, one thing, as Member of Parliament in 2015, when we were in government, um, you know, th through the local MPs' involvement, uh, we saw about $117 million come into the routing for various projects really around the region, from Fort Nelson, a bridge up there, 
uh, etc. Really saw a lot of local infrastructure um, projects done with a very cooperative provincial government at the time. Uh, that said, one of the big things that I am concerned about, especially being somebody that lives in the Peace, is that Peace River Bridge. It's a key connector to the whole northern part of the province, really, and even to, the, to Alaska. So one thing we did, we sent around a survey asking uh, residents, because the BC government had asked, you know, for some feedback about what that bridge should look like. And all the feedback that I've heard so far out of options out of a four-lane bridge, a two-lane bridge, or a resurfacing, everybody that I've talked to wants it uh, as a four-lane bridge across. Now, the cost is significant. It's about, I'm told, $250 million. But it's something I, I've talked to local MLAs, Mike Bernier and Dan Davies about, and we are absolutely committed to doing what we can to get that bridge built. I think that bridge idea is an excellent idea, and uh, I'm all in favor of it. One thing that People's Party of Canada is going to do differently than every, I think, everyone else here is that when election time comes, you're going to find all kinds of boutique kind of, uh, you know, promises and, and uh, you know, freebies, you know, to people. Like, for instance, over in Quebec, they're talking about, uh, you know, a $2 billion light rail system and all these other kinds of things. What you have to understand, though, is where is this money coming from? Uh, okay, now, we can go ahead and promise all kinds of things as well, but we want to be able to balance the budget and go after the debt. And uh, everything else uh, here, like, I mean, you're going to be spending billions of dollars, like, to put it into perspective, okay? We have so much federal debt that the Conservatives and Liberals have racked up that we're, uh, for a family of four, it's $80,000 that this is owed. Right now we're paying $25 billion uh, a year just to pay the interest. And I think that actually it could be quite a bit more because they kind of hide it with a clever accounting. Uh, so this is a provincial issue that has to be done. And also you're paying 35 cents on every gallon of gas that you're, that you're doing. And that's to pay for the roads and the bridges and all these other kinds of things. That, that's where that money should come from. So uh, we're very in favor of, of seeing everything go and develop, but the thing is, is we're not going to go and buy your vote with borrowed money that your kids, children's children are going to pay interest on. The Green Party platform offers the optimization of road transportation and bus systems to reach and facilitate travel for our northern and most rural residents. Managing urban and cross-country railway systems to be more efficient for the transport of people and goods. And so if the Peace River Bridge was at the top of priority list for this community or re northern region, then it would definitely be at the top of the list and we would explore that. I think that the, the Liberal government would work hand in hand with the provincial government when it comes to infrastructure. And it's something I talked about in my introduction. I think that the connectivity in the north really needs to happen and safe transportation is also a real issue in the north. We had those murders out on the Alaska Highway last summer. And I think for the studies, obviously, would have to be done. But for instance, when you travel the Oregon coast to California every summer, I, I mean, I have, um, there have huge spaces that are rest areas that are well lit. They have clean bathrooms. They have an emergency telephone. And a lot of people pull over, and they really are safe places. And so in terms of our infrastructure in the north, I think we really have to look at things like that, where there's a safe place where you can go to pull over if you broke down, if you can at least get there, there's something there on the highway. So I think infrastructure really is urgent, and it's really important, and there's much to be done. And then the saying I said 35 cents per gallon, it's 35 cents per liter. <laughs> <laughs> That's how old school I am. Okay, we have a question from the audience regarding your climate action plan. Please outline your climate action plan and state whether it's good or bad for BC. So putting a price on pollution to fight climate change and put money back in the pockets of Canadian families launching the Ocean Protection Plan, which is the single largest investment in Canadian history to protect our oceans at $1.5 billion, taking real action to ban harmful single-use plastics by 2021, investing in better public transit and communication in communities across Canada, and I would say especially the North, uh, supporting renewable energy and investing in energy efficient buildings declaring a national climate emergency and phasing out coal. 
I have a couple of pages, so I'll just keep it as brief as possible. So implementing a major ramp up of renewable electricity. By 2030, 100% of Canada's electricity will come from renewable sources. Create a grid where re renewable energy flows across provincial and territorial boundaries and national electrical grid strategies. Working with provincial governments to determine which optimal, optimized oil and gas wells are geological suited to produce geothermal energy, and that's orphan wells. Yeah, this July was declared that it's a climate emergency, not a, just climate change. And um, one thing to go and look at, I've learned this a long time ago, is you can't believe politicians. And you can't believe people are going to sell you, this is going to be a trillion dollar money transfer system per year, actually, worldwide. And um, so you go and look at Justin Trudeau flying around with two uh, 737 jets and, uh, and Elizabeth May, she travels all, flies all over the place as well. I know that I live a 10 times greener lifestyle than they do. And so these people, uh, are they really believing what they're saying to you? So, you know, just go ahead and look at that. Uh, we don't buy into that there is a man-made climate emergency. Uh, yes, CO2 can affect uh, 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 temperature, but it's such a minor scale of things compared to the sun and the orbit of the Earth and all these other types of things. I'd like to read with you just a couple things here. We need to get some broad-based support to capture the public's imagination. We have to offer up scary scenarios, make simplified, dramatic statements, and make little mention of any doubts. Does that sound familiar? Each of us has to decide what's the right balance. And this is the lead author, Stefan Schneider, of many IPP, IPCC reports. Another one, unless we announce disasters, no one will listen. Sir John Houston, first chairman of the IPCC. So this is, uh, we're in alignment with 31,000 uh, scientists who uh, say that uh, uh, man-made global warming is, is a misnomer. And there's another 500 scientists who've actually sent a, <clears throat> a letter to the UN stating that there's no man-made climate emergency. And that's the big difference between the PPC and everyone else. And if you want to see your industry shut down, all the other parties will do it because they're going to go with the Paris Climate Accord and a whole host of other things. Well, I'll disagree with Ron on that one. Uh, we are concerned about our emissions. Uh, we've made that very clear as a Conservative Party, but we also understand that we're not going to do the world any favours by getting killing our natural resource-based economy in Canada. And the example is, is if we, we actually produce 1.6 of global emissions, 1.6% of the total. So if we were to stop all our emissions today, which means shut down Kanumakal, shut down every kind of resource project in the area, especially around Chetwind, it would only have an impact, China would overtake that impact in 21 days. That's how much of an impact we would, we would lose, I guess. So what we're suggesting is why don't Canada, why in Canada, we have some of the highest environmental standards in the world. Why don't we give the world more Canada? And the example that I'll use is natural gas. And a lot of us have a, a very uh, good knowledge about how LNG works and how natural gas is available plentifully around this area. Provides us a lot of local jobs. Do you know that if we send natural gas to China, some of their more inefficient uh, forms of energy in their production, we could half of those emissions, half them. So one example too is just with a carbon capture project, if we sent over Canadian technology, and I think it's to 100, uh, uh, not refineries, but uh, energy producers over there, if we put carbon capture technology on those particular uh, energy producers, we could reduce their pollution by 300 megatons with Canadian technology. The bottom line is, Canada, we're the experts at green technology, producing clean resource, uh, whether it's natural gas, oil, coal. Uh, we can do it cleanly. I think the world needs more Canada, not less. We'll take a question from the audience. What are you going to try to do to help the farmers and ranchers? Yeah, um, you asked me the question a while ago when you came in. Uh, I'd like to say we have a really good record as a Conservative Party and, and uh, just the way we cared about farmers. I think uh, just starting off with uh, the CN issue with getting grain to market after you know, uh, the wheat board, we had marketing freedom for Western Canadian grain farmers. That was one of our first priorities. I was proud to be on that select committee that had that, uh, the Western Freedom uh, enacted. 
uh, I literally had grain farmers come to me in tears saying we were waiting for this day to happen. And for those in the room who don't know, what used to happen before for Western Canadian grain farmers, if they were to sell their grain to anybody else except the wheat board, it was a criminal offense. So we had grain farmers that would sell grain to the Americans on the U.S. side literally end up in jail for doing that. When the same farmers in Ontario and other parts of the provinces in Canada could sell it legally. It was a terrible injustice to Western Canadian grain farmers. Uh, we saw that freedom come. Then we saw the other problem of such a, a marketing openness where, where Canadian farmers could market their grain internationally is that we saw a problem of getting that grain to market. And one thing that we see is a constant problem now is we see a lack of access to grain cars or timely grain cars too. So one thing that we did again when we were in government, we actually fined CN when they weren't producing enough grain cars for those farmers to get their grain to market. Uh, we also support uh, local Southeast, Southeast grain growers as well, uh, helping them establish themselves as a place to, to deliver their grain and to get it to market. Uh, I think we've proven it in the past. We care about our, our beef producers too. And I think a larger answer to your question, I think the big part of what we deal with in Canada is we have to trade with other countries to, for our farmers to really do well. And we've worked on CETA. That was a conservative initiative with 500 million customers in Europe. And uh, again, I think this government has been sadly lacking in defending farmers, especially in the beef industry to China, grain, I'm out of time. <laughs> One of the things that we want to be able to do is get rid of the communist system of supply management, where 19,000 producers of milk, dairy, and eggs uh, basically have a cartel over this industry. So what happens is uh, it's not a very localized uh, thing. So uh, it eliminates local farmers to be able to produce these products and to be able to sell them legally. I see them in the farmers markets, you know, eggs being sold and different things, but, but on a large scale it's not to be, you know, it's the supply management. So we want to be able to phase that out and uh, have it so that all the uh, farmers will be able to freely uh, choose what they're going to be able to develop. Uh, there's also with the grain fees uh, that are being charged that um, we want to be able to re reduce those. We want to get rid of the, the carbon tax. Uh, we can't do it on the provincial level, the, you know, you're stuck with that. But on a federal level, we're not going to have it. So we're not going to be able to, uh, you know, hurt the farmer that way, as the others will. Uh, we want to eliminate the interprovincial trade barriers that we have in Canada. Uh, and it's not, you know, like the wine growers and uh, selling their wines or whatever across uh, the, pro the, 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 the country here. They can't do it very easily, and that's just one example, but uh, there's all kinds of different things, and it amounts to about a 3% tax that people are paying. It's actually sometimes easier for us to be able to trade with foreign countries than it is for another province, and that's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be in Canada that we're supposed to have open and free trade with amongst our, our provinces, and so we're going to go ahead and, and work towards that, and uh, there'll be law, law cases on it and everything else, but uh, we'll, we will have the Constitution to back it, so uh, that'll happen. How many people invest in food production in this room? Mm, a few, even if it's to your own garden or on your patio. This is the most important investment for humans to invest in. 80, over 80% 80 of our grocery store shelves are now riddled with foods that are coming from genetically modified organisms. Genetically modified organisms, we have no proof about what their long-term consequences are within our bodies or within the food system itself, what we're doing to the land. The Green Party platform is heavily investing in regenerating soils from industrial agriculture. This is my favorite topic. It's something I'm very passionate about, and I'm going to read a few more points just to highlight that. So establishing a climate change emissions targets for all components of the food systems, including nitrogen fertilizers, livestock production, and transportation. Funding research and extending support for farmers shifting from conventional to organic and regenerative farming systems, which would work with nature, not against it, to produce the food. Invest $2.5 million into each year into land and quota trust programs and farming apprenticeship programs to expand local small-scale agriculture and help new farmers get started. If you're a farmer, you'd realize that your kids may not be interested in what you do, although you wish they would. They don't see the value financially in looking at a lifestyle. Farmers choose to do what they do because they believe what they do is good. Protect the right of farmers to save their own seed and promote heritage seed banks and the seeds, seed 
seed exchange programs. Seeds right now are going extinct across the globe. We are now growing more and more seed through genetically met, through the GMOs that allows us to just produce a certain small small group of seeds that actually aren't heritage seeds, which means we're losing our gene pool, which actually loses our genetics and our own nutritional value. Support rooftop and community gardens, assist in reestablishing the infrastructure. Is that my time? That's your time. Okay. Maybe we'll come back to that topic. Thank you. <clears throat> the mandate for agriculture and agri-food is to support the agricultural sector in a way that allows it to be a leader in job creation and innovations. The Liberals have provided 630 green job opportunities for young Canadians in the agriculture and agri-food sector under the Agricultural Youth Green Jobs Initiative. They've also introduced a new loan designed specifically for women agricultural entrepreneurs through the Farm <coughs> Credit Canada in Budget 2018. I worked with the Farm Credit Canada to re reduce the stigma around mental health in Canadian agriculture by collaborating with 4-H Canada and industry partners to create a national program that supports m the mental and physical health of 4-H youth and created a resource for managing stress and anxiety on the farm titled Rooted in Strength, which has been delivered to every farm in Canada. Invested $100 million in agricultural science and research and hired 75 new agricultural scientists to address em emerging priorities such as climate change and water conservation to help mitigate <coughs> biological threats to agriculture. To help dairy pr processors invest in robotic and other automated systems to improve farm productivity through the four years. A hundred million dairy processing investment fund and the five-year 250 million dairy farm investment program delivered on our commitment to continue to strongly support our world-class dairy farming supply management system, signed a three billion Canadian agricultural partnership with the provinces and territories to help create a modern, sustainable and prosperous agricultural sector, supported the Canadian aquaculture industry by investing $2.48 million. In many parts of Canada and virtually everywhere in British Columbia, there's a serious lack of rental housing. The increasing demand means soaring prices, not only in major city centres, but also in rural and retirement communities. As prices increase, builders are incentiv incentivized to build new units for sale rather than for rent. Will your government increase tax incentives, removal of GST on rentals, to encourage construction of much needed rental housing? All Canadians deserve a safe and affordable place to call home. A home makes Canadians feel more secure, making it easier to raise healthy children, pursue an education and gain employment. Affordable housing has meant all the difference for families and people of all ages and all walks of life. For 10 years, the Conservatives like Stephen Harper and Andrew Scheer did nothing to address housing affordability, pushing home ownership further out of reach and putting household debt on the rise. That's why the first ever national housing strategy is moving forward with a 10-year, $40 billion plan that will give Canadians a place to call home. The Liberal plan for the first ever national housing strategy is a blueprint for reducing homelessness by 50%, removing more than 530,000 households out of housing need, creating 100 thousand new building units, four times more than what the province, provincial gov previous governments did during the last 10 years, repairing and renewing more than 300,000 housing units, three times more than what the previous governments did in the last 10 years, Protest protecting an additional 385,000 households from losing an affordable place to, to live. The new housing strategy is re-establishing the federal government's leadership role in housing. The primary focus of this strategy will be meeting the needs of Canadians, including seniors, women and children, 
fleeing from family violence, Indigenous people, persons with disabilities, and those dealing with mental health issues and addictions, veterans and young adults. A key part of the strategy is the Canada House Housing Benefit. The Liberal government will work with provinces and territories to develop a $4 billion Canadian housing benefit to be launched in 2020 to respond to local housing needs and priorities. Next to food, we all need a home. In Prince George, where I've been working for the last 20 years, we have hundreds of homeless people. The Green Party would appoint a Minister of Housing to strengthen the national housing strategy so that meets the needs for affordable housing that are unique to each province and oversee its implementation in collaboration with provincial ministers. This recognizes that housing is a provincial jurisdiction. The target would be 25,000 new and 15,000 rehabilitated units annually for the next 10 years. We would increase the National Housing Co-Investment Fund by $750 million for new builds and the Canada Housing Benefit by $750 million for rent assistance for 125,000 households. Create a Canadian co-op housing strategy that would update the mechanisms for financing co-op housing in partnership with CMHC, co-op societies, credit unions and other lenders. We would eliminate the first time home buyers grant. And at the top of the list, we would legislate housing as a legally protected fundamental human right for all Canadians and permanent residents. One thing to note with all these promises that you're getting here, like with the Liberals, they've already racked up $72 billion of debt in the last four years. In the next four years, they're looking at $90 billion, and you can see how that's going to go. With socialism, uh, you make it and we'll take it. That's how it works. Uh, I'm a journeyman carpenter and I became a carpenter because I wanted to build my own home. I'm very much in, in the thinking of homes and uh, energy efficient homes and homes that are effective, uh, you know, to, to be able to, uh, I mean, uh, to be able to afford to uh, buy, I guess. The problem we're having actually right now is we're having too much uh, supply demand issues, right? We're having, you know, over 300,000 people immigrate into Canada just in immigration alone. We got 45,000 that came in illegally at Roxham Road. You also have uh, the temporary foreign workers and uh, the people who actually come and do education. So you're, act you're talking a, a lot of people coming into Canada, and, and that's why, you know, prices are going up. You just go look at, in Vancouver, you also have a lot of foreign ownership, and they're buying everything up. Uh, so what we want to do is we actually have an immigration platform, which I would urge you to go look at. We want to lower immigration uh, to half of what that is and make sure that twice as many people have good jobs coming uh, to Canada. Um, now, one thing that's uh, frightening, actually, is the Global Compact on Migration. The Liberals' uh, immigration minister, who wasn't even born in Canada, Hussein, he helped draft this up. It's a global compact on migration. We've signed on to it, and it's not immigration, it's migration. The UN has 284 million people ready to migrate into Western democracies. They're not going to be going into China or into Saudi Arabia. They can come here. You go look at the pack, look at 15, sections 15 to 20. When they come here, we are going to be responsible for uh, their social needs. Uh, we have to develop our educational system to, to fit them in. We have to provide translators, and on and on and on it goes. It's just going to be a total nightmare, and it's going to, and it goes under Agenda 2030, which Stephen Harper adopted in September of 2015, one month before the previous election. It's based on Agenda 21. Go look at my videos on Agenda 21. You see what's coming to a neighborhood near you. Thank you uh, for that question. Uh, right away, uh, we don't have a tax in uh, incentive to build uh, rental. Uh, uh, residences, but uh, what we do have though is we want young home buyers to be able to buy a home or young folks that would normally be renting to buy a home and and that's we hope to happen by using the mortgage stress test. So we're longer amortization period, a little bit easier to get a mortgage. So, so instead of paying rent, you're actually buying a house. I think uh, some key plans that we have and their tax in, uh, incentives, but uh, affect a whole bunch of our population. Uh, removing the carbon tax is a big one. So you can actually afford that, that mortgage payment. Remove the GST off of home heating bills to save uh, costs. Make maternity benefits tax-free. Provide a universal tax cut to all hardworking taxpayers. And uh, children fitness tax credit, children arts and learning tax credit. Um, we think that you should be a homeowner and uh, not a renter if possible and be able to build up um, your equity in your own home, and that's what we would support you doing.
Given that Canada's debt level has increased despite a relatively strong economy, there is concern about the precedent set for future government spending initiatives. What is your plan to ensure Canada's debt burden remains low and affordable today and for future generations? Yeah, it's a, I think there's a, a principle behind having a balanced budget. Um, this government promised by 2019 we were supposed to be in balance. And we've seen that the spending is just out of control, uh, especially when the economy is supposed to be firing on all cylinders. We're still spending way more money than we're taking in. And uh, we all know what interest is, and Ron has alluded to that too. Uh, there's no magic interest rate that Canadians pay. It's not some lesser rate than the market is the market interest rate. So it's a very expensive thing is to have all that interest. And uh, we often say we don't want to use our credit card and pass it on to our kids like Carter here and give him the credit card bill and say, here you go, here's your $100,000 bill for what I just spent. I don't think any of us want to be irresponsible the way to leave him uh, with that debt in the future. Uh, we do have a plan to get back to balance. Uh, we've looked at the numbers. It's going to be a little bit longer than we anticipated to get there, but we're determined to get there. Uh, I think it's an understanding. We went through this process with Deficit Reduction Action Plan on our previous government where we actually took 10% out, out of our budget to get back to balance. It wasn't easy, but one thing that we did was part of our mandate was, uh, I'll use the example of egg and agri-food. So I was on the egg committee. So Jerry Ritz is a good friend of mine. And when we got this uh, mandate to take 5% out of the egg budget, and so the bureaucracy came back and said, look, okay, all these farmer programs then to farmers like you are going to get cut. And Jerry went back to the bureaucracy and said, no, no, it's not going to come out of their hide. It's going to come out of the bureaucracy's hide. And so out they came with all the cuts, but it came within the parameters that building of the bureaucracy. It, 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 affected, it affected the government, not the farmers. And we, and we added another 5% in cuts to total 10%. And I think that's just... We as conservatives uh, don't want to see cuts to the, the farmer and the person on the ground. We think we need to take a good look at ourselves before we uh, cut elsewhere. Uh, this is a very big issue. It's been a very big issue for me ever since I started voting. When I voted for Brian Mulroney so uh, Pierre Trudeau <laughs> wouldn't get in because he spent money like a drunken sailor. But yet I found that Brian Mulroney did the same. Now he had to deal with high interest rates, that's true. But if you go and factor in from Pierre Trudeau till now, if you factor in inflation, the Conservatives have actually racked up 40% more debt than the Liberals. Stephen Harper racked up $142 billion of, of new debt. Uh, so this is a very concerning thing. And so with the People's Party of Canada, we are going to make it a main focus to go ahead and balance the budget in two years. And we tell you how we're going to do it. Uh, anyone else who says they're going to balance the budget, ask them what they're going to do in order to achieve those targets. Number one is we're not going to five to ten billion dollars a year get spent on corporate welfare. So that's uh, small businesses and you as your individuals, your money is going towards, uh, you know, paying out these big companies, GM, Bombardier, SNC Lavalin, and uh, buying refrigerators for, uh, what's that company? <laughs> the food company. But anyhow, so it's, um, uh, this is kind of, we're, so we're going to ax that. So that's going to save five to ten billion dollars right there. There's another five billion dollars that's being spent outside of Canada, wasted pretty much, uh, going into foreign development. Uh, and this, and this isn't foreign aid. Like we're going to still go ahead and do foreign aid. If there's a, a tra you know, tragedy uh, across the world, hurricane or something like that, we'll be there. But we're not going to go ahead and build roads in Africa. We're not going to go ahead and put money into an investment bank in China. And we're not going to go and spend, like they did, $2.3 billion to African dictatorships to fight climate change. Now, the thing is with the Conservatives is that they're going to be talking about spending money overseas to help other countries fight climate change. So you have to you know, ask the question, how much is that? We're going to also defund CBC. That's over a, tr a billion dollars a year. And, um, and they can go ahead and they can start at, you know, putting advertisements up or whatever it takes for them to go ahead. And we'll you know, do it nicely over four years probably. But, but there's many things that we can do. We're also, with our immigration system as it is, it's uh, $30 billion and we can fix that. Fair taxation. So the Green Party platform has a list here, and I'll try and summarize, but if you have want more details, I can certainly share them afterwards. So establish an arm length federal tax commission to analyze the tax system for fairness and accessibility. The last tax commission was issued in 1960. It's far overdue. 
end offshore tax dodging by taxing funds hidden in offshore havens and requiring companies to prove that foreign aff affiliates are actual functioning businesses for tax purposes. Apply a corporate tax on transnational e-commerce companies doing business in Canada by requiring the foreign vendor to register, collect, and remit taxes where the product or services are, con are consumed. Impose a financial transaction tax of point from 0.2% to 1.5, it's 0.2 now, so move it up to 0.5% of the financial sector. Um, and so this was alluded to being something that a transaction tax when you use your debit card and MasterCard, that was spoken about by other candidates um, in previous forums, it's actually for banks and the higher level transaction taxes. Eliminate all fossil fuel subsidies, including payments and tax write-offs valued at several billion dollars annually. Increase the federal corporate tax from 15 to 21 percent to bring it in line with the federal rate in the United States, our biggest trading partner. Charge a 5 percent surtax on commercial bank profits. Commercial banks accumulate huge profits. Prohibit Canadian businesses from deducting the cost of advertising on foreign-owned sites such as Google and Facebook, which now account for 80 percent of all spending on advertising in Canada. Eliminate the 50 percent corporate meals and entertainment ex expense deduction, which includes season tickets and private boxes at sporting events. But we will increase the tax credit for volunteer firefighters and search and rescue volunteers. The Liberal government investments bring, brings the total infrastructure spending to more than $180 billion, including $28 billion of fe federal funding for public transit systems across Canada. And essentially, the Liberals are investing to build a stronger, a stronger economy and a stronger Canada. We will continue to stand up for communities that make Canada strong while politicians continue to try to stand in the way. So now we have a question from the audience. Just a reminder, if you have any questions, there are papers at the back. You can jot them down and bring them on up. How will you reduce the influence of the UN on Canada's sovereignty? This is question is actually for the People's Party of Canada, for Ron. So we'll start with Ron, and then if anybody else wants to, uh, to answer, you can. Uh, Taylor made question actually. Uh, People's Party of Canada, we basically state that the UN is a dysfunctional organization. And that's an understatement. Uh, you can see basically uh, how they're uh, feeling about Canada and Western civilization with the global compact on migration. They want to flood us with millions and millions of migrants that we have to pay for. And this is all a part of Agenda 2030, which I stated before, which is based off of Agenda 21. That's why you need to go to my YouTube channel and start looking at some of the things I posted on there. But um, so uh, what they want to do in Agenda 2030 is they want to reduce the uh, wealth, wealth disparity between rich nations and poor nations. Uh, same thing with individuals as well. They want to dictate to us our levels of consum uh, consumption and also our productivity. Uh, and in there you also got uh, you know, uh, the Paris Climate Accord, uh, various other different things. And so uh, with us, we're going to be able to uh, look at these uh, UN agreements and we are going to try and get out of every single one that's not beneficial to our country. We want the government of Canada to have the, uh, you know, they, they still have the full authority even with the UN, but the UN basically lays out the terms. The governments that we have, all of these parties are all basically UN uh, driven, you know, like with a, with a focus on wanting to implement UN policies. And, and so then what happens is they go ahead and they implement it. Uh, <clears throat> we're not going to do that. And this is very grave concern. Uh, one thing that you have to start looking at is uh, UNDRIP right now. UNDRIP actually uh, states in UNDRIP here, which is a UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It says here in Section 26, uh, basically, um, that Indigenous peoples have the rights to the lands, territories, resources for which they have traditionally owned, occupied, or otherwise used. And in the leadership's debate, if you go back and look at it on October 7th, all of them said that they're going to go ahead uh, to uh, implement UNDRIP except for the Conservatives. But the Conservatives have been actually very quiet about it, and I think they're complicit on that. And the Senators are holding off on this going in through Canada right now. They're praying for a miracle. 
I'll give a stab at that one. So uh, I'm glad Ron admitted that Canada still ultimately has authority over the UN. Uh, the UN only, I guess, I, the candidate that really should be here is the NDP candidate because I'd say uh, us as a government are committed to uh, to our own laws and abiding with our own sovereignty. I think where the UN and, uh, tries to assert itself, uh, we've we support UN uh, Paris Climate Accord, for instance, where it agrees to hit the targets uh, set in tw 2005 emission levels at 30% below that. We agree to the aspirational goals of that. That's a big difference in actually being under the law of the UN. The UN doesn't hold any laws over Canada. We have sovereignty, we get to make those decisions. We can still aspire to do better in terms of lowering our emissions, to make that clear. I think the problem gets to be, though, is with like parties like the NDP who want to enshrine UN law or UN declaration or language into Canadian law. That means they're turning into what's an aspirational goal into law. And then we have to abide by that. That gets very concerning. And the UN is, is sort of as, a, as an arm's length asserting itself over our country. And that I would be concerned as well. For now, Canada has its own sovereignty and I think it should remain so. Um, yeah, the UN is a, a large entity that Canada chooses to participate in for many different reasons. It's a collaborative choice. The sustainable development goals that the UN has created was adopted by UN member states, including Canada. The 85% 85, 85 of the world's wealth is held by a small number of people. They would fit into this room. And so it's recognized that not everybody is those people. And so we need to manage the wealth accordingly. And so the UN Sustainability Development Goals, there are 17 of them, and they're all intertwined within the Green Party's platform. And they are no, p and no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, both to be respected, peace, justice, and strong institutions, and partnership for the f these goals. They're all important, and they're all things that we embrace, and I believe that being a partnership with the rest of the world on these topics are very important. I think that the you not the United Nations does stand for peace, order, and good government, and they work together in the world to bring good policy. And one of the things that Bob mentioned earlier was that the United Nations Declaration on Indigenous People was actually endorsed by Canada after many years of litigation with First Nations throughout the country and with the adoption of the United Nations Declaration on Indigenous People that will hope, hopefully bring down the uh, amount of litigation that Canada spends every year with Indigenous people. The, I, I'll believe it's the biggest budget item in their Justice Department is litigating with First Nations across the country. So adopting the United Nations Declaration could only help in bringing that price down. And we have a question from the audience. What are your thoughts on what the NDP have said about making a coalition with the Liberal Party if the Conservative do not win a majority government? Can we go first and go back down that way? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, very concerning. I think an example of that is our provincial government situation where one particular party was elected and yet uh, two other parties essentially have power based on a coalition that was never promised to the voters when they went to the ballot box. I think now at least some of those leaders, and I've seen even the prime minister seem to be agreeable to this, that there would be a coalition possibly if there's a minority situation. It should concern every one of us in the room because uh, you're voting for a particular party. If that party doesn't win in, in the particular election, uh, to prop be propped up by another uh, party in doing so, I don't I don't know. That's a difficult one for me to understand. 
especially I'd say in this room, very difficult with the NDP. Uh, the NDP have not been shy in signaling they are against resource development. They are against natural gas, they are against oil, they are against the oil sands, they are against almost every sort, uh, form of resource development in our country. And with that group holding the balance of power in Ottawa, if you think it's difficult to get a pipeline built or a coal mine built or a natural gas field developed, it's going to be a lot more difficult after. I guess the word I would use is frightening. And um, it's not just going to be the NDP. It'll be the Greens as well, I would think, as well, because they're very similar in their scope of things. And uh, so, I mean, that's why it's, we're facing such a tipping point. In my videos, when I started a uh, long time ago, uh, I say Canada's at a tipping point, and really we are. And this is why the PPC really needs to gain power, because uh, we, we can uh, you know, end a lot of this thing, the stuff that's going on. One of the things that uh, you know, we're going to do is we're not just going to go and align with another party, just for the sake of it being a party, for instance, the Conservatives or, or whoever. It's going to be on the topic. What is the topic? What's the, you know, the issue at hand? If it's a good issue, if we can align with it, we will go with it. If it's not, we won't. It's, so just to go ahead and say we're just going to align with another party, I think that's uh, problematic. But uh, anyhow, we're at a very frightening uh, juncture in Canada. In four years, a coalition can be beneficial or could be detrimental. I think the biggest issue is that we have poor voter turnout and we do not have a representation of the majority at the voter to, to actually vote on our ballots. And I actually don't know what the official Liberal Party line is with regard to a coalition, but there has been a coalition federal government in the past. In regards, to the can in, in regards to Canada's Species at Risk Act, SARA has been in place since 2002. The purposes of SARA are to prevent wildlife species in Canada from disappearing, provide for recovery of wildlife species that are extirpated, no longer exist in the wild in Canada, endangered or threatened as a result of human activity, and manage species of special concern to prevent them from becoming endangered or threatened. Currently, socioeconomic impact assessments are not required under SARA and are only brought up at the cabinet table following environmental assessment. If elected, will your government amend the Federal Species at Risk Act to include a socioeconomic socio impact and risk assessments, including a robust consultation period with the local business community? Socioeconomic impact study and risk assessments. I'm just going to go ahead and just, yeah, okay. Um, I can't speak exactly to that. I can only speak what's in our platform. And so protecting species and habitats. The Green Party would increase funding to federal departments to dramatically ramp up development and impl implementation of endangered species recovery plans required by legislation, placing high dead tight deadlines on completion and invoking emergency, emergency powers of the federal government to protect species when provincial governments fail to do so. Protect a minimum of 30% of fresh waters, oceans, and land by 2030. Commit 100 million annually over the next four years to create indigenous-led, protected, and conserved areas and fund stewardship of these lands and waters by indigenous guardians. Fully restore the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, which was gutted by the Harper government in 2012, and adopt the recommendations of the Independent Expert Panel on Environmental Assessment, commissioned by the Liberals, and then ignored. Increase funding to the Parks Canada to ensure that the ecological integrity of our national parks is maintained and, where necessary, restored, and that heritage sites are fully protected and maintained. <coughs> Pass it along. As far as the socio-economic impact, we don't have anything in our platform, so I can't really talk to it. But uh, I can talk about here, basically, Sarah is involved in this whole caribou recovery issue that you're dealing with where one million acres of land is going to be off limits. 
they're already starting to put signs up in the backcountry uh, restricting access, and it could actually be three times that amount. And there's a partnership agreement between the federal government, provincial government, West Morberley, and the SOTU uh, Aboriginal bands on this. The town councils and everything else aren't involved, but it's involving Sarah, okay? This is Sarah, and it says here, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change has determined, this is talking about the partnership agreement, there's an imminent threat to the recovery of the southern caribou, mountain caribou. And the parties recognize that the protection of the habitat of the species at risk is the key to the conservation. Okay, so you've got a, maybe a few thousand caribou over a million acres, okay, and they're talking about that it has to be the habitat that protects them. They're not talking about the wolves that uh, are getting them, and the wolf population needs to be uh, dealt with because the farmers are losing their livestock to it. They're not talking about that the hunters can't go and shoot uh, the grizzly bears. Uh, the grizzly bears are going after them too, and there's all kinds of other things that aren't even mentioned in this whole thing. But in this document, it's quite amazing. It, it says here that the purpose of the partnership agreement is to uh, expeditionally grow the population of the herd to be self-sustaining and support Aboriginal harvesting activities consistent with existing Aboriginal treaty rights. What does this have to do with uh, protecting the caribou? And in here, it also talks about that they're fully committed to adopting and implementing the United Nations declarations on the rights of Indigenous peoples and the calls to action of truth and reconciliation. So this is like a whole can of worms that is all involved with this whole thing. And uh, please, I made a video on caribou recovery. It's on my, web, on my YouTube channel. Go look it out. It's 27 minutes, but you're going to see things that you've never seen before probably. And it's absolutely vital if you want to be able to have your town uh, survive in the future. That's why you got to vote PPC. It's as simple as that. Yeah, I think uh, the room that we had the caribou conversation was just over there. And I think one thing that we learned firsthand is that the local community was not being listened to. Yeah, there was consultations that they were defined as. Uh, they came and ticked the box in every community. They said they were here, they said they listened, but we saw by the plan they really didn't listen to anything we had to say. Uh, one thing that we are committed to, one thing that Andrew is committed to as well, on, in the in our caucus, when we had these conversations about what was going on with caribou, I said, uh, you know, we need we have expertise that are real experts in the community. Uh, we have people in uh, Mackenzie that have 25 years working with caribou that fully understand what the caribou need for that herd to get bigger. We have local First Nations e expertise that knows firsthand what to do with uh, the caribou herds and how to see them increase in some local work that's been done some pending work that's been done to see the numbers increase. We have all this expertise, but only two groups were being listened to. And the one thing, again, that we're committed to is hearing from all our community members on expertise of what needs to be done to protect, whether it's caribou, if it's moose, if it's whatever species it is, is to listen to that local expertise first before any decisions were made. I think uh, what was alarming to me was that the decision, it was clearly made before they even came to the community. And uh, again, they were doing their diligence, I guess, by appearing to listen to us, but they weren't. Uh, we are committed to being uh, listeners to you, uh, local experts in the community, to do real good work that, that know how to do real good work with these species that are at risk. Thank you. So with regard to the, the caribou habitat, the intrusion into the caribou ha habitat wasn't planned, so with development, <clears throat> including forestry, oil and gas, and other industry development, including electric, hydroelectric dams, the caribou became endangered. And I think it's a good lesson that um, we have pr environmental protection in place now as as a result of situations like the caribou habitat in the north. And the intrusion into the caribou habitat wasn't planned. Bob mentioned that there's lots of expertise in the north with regard to that and how that could have been done. And so right now it's a, it's a tough lesson, but uh, like I said, there are measures in place now to ensure that doesn't happen again so that we're not in the same situation over and over again. And we have another question from the audience. We all know that Chetwin is a forestry community. 
If elected, how will you strike a balance between protecting the ecological integrity of Canada's forest and the need for an economically and environmentally sustainable forestry sector? The one of the things that the um, province is the forestry falls under the provincial jurisdiction, but the federal government would be willing to work closely with the provincial government to come up with a plan, including you know a series of consultations with local forest industry and protecting our forests for future generations. And I think that it is urgent. Uh, an urgent planning that must be done in the near future. We uh, all are impacted by the forest industry. My brothers are all or worked all their lives in the forest industry, so I know how badly people are um, being hit at, in their home communities uh, with with having the joblessness. So there's much to be done, and the federal government would definitely work closely with the province of B BC to ensure that there's a plan in place for forestry workers. And one of the things that has been done is there's been two years added to the employment benefits beyond the normal length of time on your employment benefits. So that's one strategy. But there's there certainly is a lot to be done in that field. The Green Party plans to plant millions of trees over the next 10 years to offset greenhouse gases and also to enhance the forestry in all communities where forests are already growing and communities are already invested in the forest industries. And so one of the most important components is sustainable harvesting of the forests and planting, making sure that ecologically um, appropriate trees are actually being planted. And so we, looking at value added, so instead of actually sustainably logging and shipping logs out of the province and out of the country, looking at how it is that we can value add trees in place so that communities can build community infrastructure around that. I'm not an expert on this topic, but it seems to me like generally speaking that it's fairly environmentally uh, friendly as far as how it's being done. Uh, one thing that was brought up to me was the issue of uh, when they go and uh, replant the trees and then they go and use uh, glyphosates to, you know, like a roundup in order to stop the weeds from growing. And uh, then the, uh, the animals don't want to go and eat that habit, you know, those things, and, and it causes a problem. So that's an issue that I would want to go and look at personally myself. As far as making it a sustainable uh, resource sector for you folks, I mean, we want to be able to renegotiate uh, the softwood lumber deal, and we would put supply management, uh, the issue of the milk, poultry, and eggs, on the table. Uh, President Trump, uh, he was talking about the 300% tariff that is uh, placed on their milk products uh, coming into Canada on account of this. And actually, people are paying twice the price of what uh, they should be for these products. Uh, so we can go ahead and do that. And this is a provincial issue as far as the stumpage rate fees. But uh, what's going on from what I understand in BC is that uh, it's a very, uh, uh, there's a big time to lag between uh, when they decide what the stumpage fees are going to be to when they get implemented. So if, if, you're, if the uh, rate is really high of what uh, the softwood lumber is generating and then uh, the, it might take a year for that uh, stumpage fee to equal that. Meanwhile, you can have the downturn of uh, the, uh, the, the uh, pricing that's going on. So in Alberta, what they're doing is very uh, you know, dynamic together. So as the uh, price of the softwood lumber goes up, the stumpage fees goes up and it goes down. It's very, you know, and if you have a business and it becomes unprofitable because the stumpage fees you know, have doubled on the softwood lumbers and now you have <coughs> low retail pricing. <clears throat> then you can't just you know operate your business, and so this is the kind of uh, swings that uh, need to be uh, dealt with, I think. And we would want to try and negotiate with uh, the province and see what we could do to help alleviate that problem. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think uh, I'll start off by saying that we actually had a hope with this current government. Uh, within the first hundred days of the the current Liberal government, there was a promise made from a Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, and President Obama that they would come up with a softwood lumber agreement within a hundred days. Uh, I was in Parliament at the time Obama came, uh, you know, not even as far away from me to the back of the room, uh, with hope that that agreement would be signed that afternoon. While that afternoon came and went, the President flew back to Washington and no softwood lumber agreement. Well, guess what happened next? Uh, tariffs were applied, so up to 25% in some cases to our Canadian lumber. 
At the time, we were getting good prices for our lumber at about $600 per thousand board feet. Uh, I was talking to producers in, in Prince George saying we're still making money doing this, so everything's still okay, stumpage rates were re relatively competitive. Then we saw this year things completely changed. The market dropped, went down to 300 roughly per thousand. Stumpage rates doubled. All the while there was still a 25%, 20 to 25% tariff, which means a tax on our lumber. Well, with all those factors mixed in together, it made it unviable, and I think, or, or non-viable. A lot of these forest comp companies saw this coming, and they started moving their uh, places south. Now, still, there's a lot of mills in Canada. I hope that we can draw them back, and a softwood lumber agreement would be a big part of them staying. Without that softwood lumber agreement, uh, they started shifting their resources south, and that's what really was the start of the end for us. Um, we have a plan. We, we want to strike a natural resource competitive task force because we realize the, uh, the Trump government, uh, they have their pencils sharp and we need to compete with those and others around the world. Establish a task force on the woodland caribou, protect our forests from pests, and we wouldn't be in this predicament had we done that a long time ago. Ensure real representation at regional government agencies where we actually have a voice at, at deciding this, and again, resolve the software lumber game. Thank you. The Trans Mountain Pipeline has become has overcome multiple regulatory and legal challenges and has finally been approved by the federal cabinet. Will your government commit to supporting the Trans Mountain Pipeline project to its proposed completion in 2022? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we were a little alarmed too. We'd seen the Trans Mountain Pipeline go through many processes, uh, through many consultative processes, stacks of paper, um, and approved. And then the last uh, decision was, wasn't even appealed by this current government. So we saw the government buy the pipeline. And uh, again, we kind of had this hope, especially from somebody from a resource-based community, that, you know, well, we shouldn't have had to buy it in the first place. It should have been a private industry developing this pipeline. There's a good business case to have it run privately. And then because of overregulation, you name the issues, it, become, it became, the project became at risk. So this current government bought the line, the old line. Uh, we are absolutely committed to seeing that particular line get to Vancouver. Uh, we see the resources from Alberta, unless they get to market uh, Tidewater, it's very difficult for them to keep going. And there's a world around us that wants our good, cl uh, clean Canadian technology and energy, and I think we need to give it to them. I was just at the Vale Mount Pipe Yard, uh, what, about three weeks ago? And between it and Kamloops, there's about 500 kilometers of pipe just sitting in the yard waiting to go. So if you didn't know that, the project really is just waiting to go. And this latest appeal, that again, the government, I wish they had appealed the decision, that pipeline would probably be getting done today, but it hasn't yet. So I don't have a lot of confidence that they will actually get it done based on uh, the previous inaction by the government, but my hope is that they do. Uh, our future really depends on it. I wouldn't hold my breath uh, for the Liberals to complete that project at all. I think it's just basically a vote buying scheme at this point. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we would use 9210 of the Constitution, okay, simple as that. And all the previous governments could have done the same sort of a thing. When you declare something in the national interest, then the federal government has the top authority. So when, uh, for instance, Energy East, you know, well, this other pipeline, you know, we'd absolutely support and, and get that going. But Energy East, we don't really have a, a pipeline going all the way across Canada uh, to go ahead and do that. Uh, there is a company that's come up with, uh, they're, wanting, they're wanting to go ahead and do that all the way across the, c the country and actually have a port on the end that they can actually go ahead and export if they want to go that way. So we can go ahead and unite 9210 of the Constitution and uh, no one will be able to challenge it. When Quebec says that the people don't want it, then uh, we can negotiate with them for a couple months and after that, you know, if uh, we know what they're going to say, well then that's enough. We'll go ahead and, and go with that. Um, so uh, we're very energy sector pro-resource development. We don't buy into the uh, whole thing of our, uh, climate emergency. And this is what's stifling all the different parties because they have to reduce Canada's emissions probably about 40% from today's level in 10 years. And if you're wondering why things are being stifled and, and held back, well, maybe you can take a look at that. 
And this whole thing with this pipeline, this guy told me with those mulchers there, where they had to actually take the tracks right off of the, uh, the track hoe in order to be able to wash and all this environmental stuff. It's just off the rails. And this is just, you know, like, it's just, all it is is just to stop the whole thing and to stop it in its tracks. And these people who have actually bid on it are losing money, you know, trying to go ahead with this. And uh, so I've asked that person to send me the, who is this environmentalist uh, jurisdiction that's going along looking for frogs in front of the mulchers and stuff. It's just off the charts, you know. And, and they had to t spray that equipment so many times for contamination. It's all within BC. You know, so it's just ridiculous. It's just a bunch of, you know, song and dance. In June of 2019, our Canadian government acknowledged that we were in a climate crisis. Does anybody believe that? Nope. So you don't believe that we're in a climate crisis or you don't believe that our Canadian government actually acknowledged that? Okay. So uh, on the next day, our, our Liberal government purchased the over $10 billion Trans Mountain Pipeline, and the Green Party does not support following through with that project. Justin Trudeau announced that the Liberal government has approved the Trans Mountain expansion project. Trudeau also announced that every dollar made by the federal government from the Trans Mountain expansion will be invested in clean energy pro projects. In addition, he announced the Liberal government will launch an engagement process to seek input from groups on the way that they could directly benefit financially from expansion. And the <coughs> we need to diversify our markets in order to get a fair price for the products we sell. It does not make environmental or economic self sense to sell our resource at a discount. Instead, we will use the extra earnings to fund a clean energy transition. Every dollar the federal government earns from this project will be invested to help fund things like electric electricity projects, investments in renewable resources, efforts to help Indigenous communities transition off of diesel power. Additional corporate tax revenue alone could be around $5 million per year once that project is up and running. In the 21st century, you need to have a plan for the environment and a plan for the economy. So we have spent the last four years doing more for our environment than any other government in Canadian history. At the same time, Canadians have created more than 1 million new jobs, lifted 825,000 people out of poverty and have the lowest unemployment rate on record. For 10 years, the Harper Conservatives ignored Indigenous, environmental and legal concerns and because of that did not get a single inch of pipeline built to new markets. Andrew Shear has learned nothing from the failed approach and has no plan to fight climate change. Okay, so we are at the 8.30 mark. So it is time for closing statements. Closing statements are three minutes each. Um, it should only take about 10 or 15 minutes. I invite our candidates and I invite our audience to stick around for a little bit after a while so you, you can have a chance to chat with your uh, representatives. So where do you want to start here? You don't know how many times of the name start, starting with Zed. I was always at the end. Even in Parliament, just in case you don't know, uh, it's still alphabetical. If you're not a minister, they still organize you alphabetically. So I have paid for that Z name all my life. So thank you. Thank you for making me first for once. So, no, I just want to thank you for coming out tonight, especially young guys like Carter uh, with a really cool front yard that has a spider that moves when you walk by it and stuff. Uh, but this is really why we do what we do for communities like Chetwind, is we want to see these small young families stay in Chetwind in places like rural Canada in general. And we think rural Canada is even at risk um, you know, when, when jobs start leaving and the economy starts weakening, well, first thing mom and dad have to do is make sure that there's food on the table and a roof over their head so they go somewhere else. And they might fly into the job instead of staying in Chetwind. And we're seeing that to large effect in places like Fort Nelson, where it's very difficult uh, to have, the, have a baby there, uh, to stay there as a young family. So 
Uh, that's why we do what we do for communities like Chatwood. We want to make sure the resource sector is strong, uh, the forest sector is strong. Um, we all know Trans Canada has got a lot of work around here that's keeping a lot of people employed. I hear the hotels, it's even tough to get a hotel room in Chetwin right now, which is a really good thing. Uh, we've all seen how, you know, when the plant up on the hill got built and then that lull afterwards, it really had an effect on the community. But uh, no, we believe in you as Chetwin uh, people and, and support you in whatever challenges you face. Uh, I'd like to say that I've, I've stuck up for you in the past and will do in the future. Uh, whenever you need something, I'm as close as a phone call away. And uh, I think we proved that over the last eight years. And uh, I'll just finish with this. I think us, we talk about our different uh, governments and what we have planned. I think we really, we have to start caring about the rural Canadians that are really affected by these cuts. And uh, we've talked about, we, we care about the climate, we care about our environment, but we also don't want to bankrupt our communities in doing so. Uh, some parties don't have plans for the interim. They talk about getting rid of all resource development, but what do we do in the middle 50 years before the jobs finally kick in on the green side? They don't have answers for you. Uh, we think we can develop our resources in places like Chatwin, we can develop our resources responsibly, and also be a positive influence on the world in terms of reducing pollution. So I think we need to keep what we're doing in Chetwind. Uh, I'll, I know I'll keep working hard on your behalf in Ottawa if I'm re-elected after October 21st. And again, I'm only a phone call away. Call me if you need me and uh, we'll be around later for questions. Thank you. Uh, People's Party of Canada, we don't believe that there's a climate emergency. We believe that there's a governance emergency within Canada. The last 50 years of the Liberals and Conservatives have actually brought Canada to a tipping point, and they're both uh, responsible for this. We call it the LibCon party, the two sides of the same coin. Uh, they brought us to a tipping point on many levels, financially, loss of our freedom of speech, Western alienation and separation, and Alberta's talking about separating if the Liberals get back in, and it's very strong. Endless United Nations agreements and compacts, out of control debt, destruction of public trust in our democratic system, on and on we go. And uh, so one thing you need to consider here when it comes to this election, that people worry about vote splitting uh, with the People's Party of Canada with the Conservatives. Just imagine the People's Party wasn't even around and all you had to do is just vote for the Conservatives. What are you going to get? You're basically going to get 20% different than what the Liberal Party is as far as their party platform. And uh, so I wouldn't worry about that. And also, we're going to actually, you watch what happens in Quebec. I mean, they're very protectionistic about their situation over there, and we have the policies that will help that. What you're actually witnessing today uh, is you're seeing a uh, 21st century David and Goliath story, actually. And um, right now, the PPC is David. Uh, the corrupt establishment and the hidden powers that hold the levers of control are, are Goliath. And the smooth stone that takes out that Goliath is your vote, actually, in the sling of the PPC. And I firmly believe that we, uh, the PPC has been brought up for such a time as this. And I just pray that you will have the eyes to see and the ears to hear what's really coming down. And now is your chance. I mean, uh, it's a bold opportunity. We have 320 candidates across Canada. We can form government. All we need is your vote. And so please vote Ron Valent and the PPC if you want to be able to protect your communities and uh, your resource sector as well. So thank you. The six guiding principles of the Green Party are <clears throat> ecological wisdom, social justice, participatory democracy, nonviolence, sustainability, and respect for diversity. These principles do not waver and are at the heart of the Green Party policies. These principles do not change to try and gain more votes at each election. If other parties had listened to our platform 30 years ago, we would not be in the climate crisis we are in now. We would have already weaned ourselves off of fossil fuels and would be leading the world in renewable technologies. There are answers. The Green Party will invoke the precautionary principle in making decisions about approvals of products, substances, projects and processes where there is a potential for irreversible harm. If there is no scientific, pr scientific proof of safety, then approval will be withheld. Ban the production, distribution, and sale of single-use plastics. At this point, 80% of all seabirds, we are finding that they are ingesting plastics, let alone other sea species. We will ramp up the development and implementation of endangered species recovery plans. 
We rely on global ecological diversity to survive as humans on this planet. We will replace the secretive board of economy with an independent oversight committee to review MP salary, expenses, and office budgets. We will strengthen the lobbying act to require greater, tra greater transparency and prevent revolving doors between political life, the public service, and lobbying. Voting green takes pride and determination. I understand that we don't all agree, but it's time to vote for change. As long as the polar bears don't have their sea ice to swim to, and the permafrost is no longer frozen, we have a problem. First of all, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I think it's a really good um, turnout here in Chetwin, especially after a long weekend. I, <clears throat> I um, love the North, and I want to be your MP in Ottawa so I can <clears throat> get Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies benefiting in every way from the vast wealth of resources in the north. I can provide a strong voice in Ottawa. I am asking for the voters to rock the Liberal vote in Prince George, Peace River, and Northern Rockies riding. I <clears throat> believe in the north having a uh, greater connect interconnectivity, whether it's with the highways, whether it's with the internet, but we need to start benefiting from our our resources in the north. I also speak out for diversity in the north. We have a huge diversity in the north that I so appreciate the multicultural country that we all come from and we're all encouraged to be proud of our our roots. I have a long I have a loud strong voice. I would like to be your MP in Ottawa. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming out this evening. Like I said, we've got probably 20 minutes to a half an hour left here. Like I said, I invite everybody to stay, um, have a coffee, grab a water, and have uh, get into some further discussion. If you have any questions that you didn't get a chance to ask, now's your time. So um, all of our candidates are off to Mackenzie tomorrow and then back to Dawson Creek on the 17th. So if you would like to attend um, other forums, those two are still available. So thank you so much for everybody for coming out this evening. I'd like to ask one question. Mr. Zimmer knows where I stand on this. Mm -hmm. What are you people going to do for the veterans? Already they've cut back the benefits for the guys that need medical attention. This is a crock. We put our life on the line for $86 a bloody month. Now they get two, three, four thousand dollars a month. Now I, I'm a veteran. I'm a veteran of two UN missions, NATO mission, Cuban crisis, uh, Cuban missile crisis, uh, and the FLQ crisis. I've been through them all. I've been put on 24-hour standby to pack my gear and get the hell down there and start and stop it. Now, liberals and conservative governments, we've had 30 plus some petitions in the House of Commons. One, has, one I know of has been read into Hansard, been given a number. But all of a sudden they're tabled forgotten about and the veterans are put into the abyss of forgetfulness. Now we have hundreds and hundreds of veterans have served, never went overseas, did not even do 12 years, they were discharged, have nothing to show for their service. <coughs> what we want to know is why our petitions to bring back the Canadian Military Volunteer Medal for their service to Canada is not honored and reestablished. We as veterans pooled money to have the dyes made by Joe Druin Enterprises. We had the metal struck, we've had the ribbon struck, and we wear it. We wear it with pride. But this cost us $15 a piece to get that medal. 
yet the Senate can spend $160,000 to have a medal struck, to give themselves a medal. What's wrong with that picture? Wouldn't even have cost half that to do that for the veterans. And when I talk about veterans, I'm talking Army, Navy, Air Force, and your, uh, rain, your Rangers. They're all veterans. RCMP are all veterans. And yet, we are put at the bottom. I've been fighting since 1968 with Veterans Affairs. And I'll be dead before I get to the end of it. Because I'm 80 years old now. There was something wrong with this picture. Why the governments in this country are avoiding and neglecting and forgetting the veterans except for one day of the year, November 11. But they forget one thing, veterans do not forget. I'd like to know why they will not bring the petition back off the table. I have personally sent correspondence to every member of the part of government in the House of Commons, two governor generals, and if I have to, I'll write, I'll write across the pond to the Queen. I don't think it's fair. We got a lot of issues with seniors and indigenous people, homeless people. You people don't realize how many veterans are homeless on the street. No place to go. Yeah, and I know you've been fighting for this a while. I think I was one of the ones that brought the petition uh, to Ottawa a couple years ago. And um, I think I think it all starts with respect. I was on Veterans Affairs Committee for a while, and the one thing we tried to establish was uh, we the, the respect that we have for you as veterans needs to be bureaucracy-wide. So when you call in to get service, it's that it's it goes back to that public service. They really are serving you as public servants, and that really needs to be the attitude from the bureaucracy at Veterans Affairs. Uh, we want to establish a military covenant between government and veterans. So there's an, an automatic service level that's a mutual respectful one. Um, the one that I was even asked to do too by other veterans in the community. You know, this is something too that if you're not a veteran, it, it seems like it's, you know, because it doesn't relate to you as an issue, even the 150 year service medal. So we had a celebration of Canada's 150th. Okay, and every time before we had a significant milestone, Queen's Jubilee was the latest one that I was honored to give 30 medals out in this community to. This government wouldn't even have a 150 medal for all its veterans. And you tell me the cost that that would cost, just, out of, just showing that little bit of respect to our veterans, just as a medal. But to that veteran, it means everything, right? And why does this government think that's too expensive to provide that medal to our veterans? I don't understand that. Uh, I do think we have to work hard to gain your respect uh, if we get in. I think it's something every government should pursue with all its vigor and, and all its energy because of what you did for us. And uh, I'm committed to doing that. Thank you. Well, I'll let some do this. They have, the answer I got back, and I have no respect for, I would not follow in, him into battle as your defense minister. To us, he, he was just a weekend warrior. He lied about his service in Afghanistan, so, so right now he lost all respect to veterans. So, sorry, did you want the other yeah, they can, to answer? But I just want to add this. But he came back from his office with a letter to me, quoting a five-year moratorium that they wouldn't abandon, yet Great Britain, New Zealand, and Australia went back and honored their veterans with volunteer medal. They called it a defense medal. And they went back right to the 1940s. So it was March 1st, 1947, that they quit 
issuing and honoring the veteran volunteer medal. Korea broke out, they got it after Korea, nobody got it. Now, if these three Commonwealth countries can do that, why can't Canada? <clears throat> the People's Party of Canada have released a specific platform on veterans and uh, what we want to do with the military. So please go check it out, peoplespartyofcanada.ca. Uh, one of the issues is uh, we want to be able to have it so that the veterans know that the government has their back. And this is the difference between the People's Party of Canada and all the other parties. Because if you go and look at the UN, the UN wants to set up a UN Parliamentary Assembly. They basically want to run the world. They want to take the guns from the individual people and they want to uh, disarm uh, nations. And one of the ways you can do that is to defund it and to uh, demoralize the uh, military. Uh, we are very pro-Canada and uh, we want to uh, say goodbye to the UN you know, as much as possible. So we, we are absolutely uh, in favor of supporting the military. We want to be able to increase funding so that we have proper equipment. And, um, and we're looking at possibly 2% of GDP in, in, if it was two terms that we were in. But one thing that we want to do uh, right away, once we, once we balance the budget, we're going to go and work on this, and that is that the uh, lifetime pension uh, that was taken away in 2006 uh, under the Stephen Harper government, actually, in February they came into power, and on April 1st they come up with their new veterans charter, and basically there was a lump sum payment that was made instead of it being a lifetime pension that, that was tax-free, and then the Liberals came in there and uh, they've gone and done their things, and basically it's like one-third of what uh, would have been given if it was a lifetime pension. So we're going to go ahead and, and reinstate that, and we're going to go retroactive back to 2006. So uh, if you had a lump sum payment, if you were a, a disabled uh, war veteran, and you had a lump sum payment, that will be factored into the total amount that would be paid out to you. Uh, I urge you, just go and check out our thing here, uh, but we, we absolutely want to uh, support our military in every way we can. So. Do, you know, do you know the amount that lifetime pension was? The, life, the, the lump sum? Nope. If it was a lifetime pension, do you know how much it was? No, I don't know. It was $160,000. Okay? Now, I beat them on one, and I got, they paid, you know, as I say, lump sum, lump sum. That's all they think about. So now, is this prior to 2006? You're talking about the lifetime disability pension that was tax-free? Or the after? At, at one was tax-free. But if I lived, if I got that when I was 25 and I lived till I was 90, as soon as that 160,000 was finished, that was it. Yeah, but are There's, you talking a lump sum payment? No, lump sum payments, well, they, 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 that was a percentage, they'd figure out what you needed and they'd send you something. Because so a lump sum payment came after Stephen Harper changed it to two, I know, after 2006. I know. I'm okay. very well versed in I'm this. sure you are. <laughs> <laughs> and, the thing is, I get a letter from <clears throat> Veterans Affairs Department saying, we can't compensate you any more uh, money. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been suffering for nearly 60 years, and a lot of us ended up with this problem mm -hmm. when we were over in Africa, and they still deny it. They deny it. For all these years, they've been denying it. The only thing to give me any compensation for is for my hearing. Okay, well, you, you check know, out our party platform, and we're very committed. And any and, money uh, I got, can, any money I got, I put into medical expenses and transportation accommodations to try to keep my wife alive. Well, thank you for sharing. Would you like me to carry on? Um, as I mentioned in my opening, I work on the executive director of Connaught Youth Center Society in Prince George, and that facility actually houses Army, Air, Navy, and Sea Cadets. It's the only facility in Canada that actually house all cadets in one building. And so I see firsthand that not only does DND not support our veterans and our federal government supporting our veterans, but they're also not supporting our cadets as they go up through training. Our cadets are actually doing bake sales and wrestling matches just to raise money for their uniforms and for their training camps. I'm gonna go through the Green Party's platform for honoring veterans. The Green Party values the work and sacrifices of all Canadian forces and RCMP veterans and active personnel and will ensure that the veterans and their families are well cared for. 
The fact that suicide rates are among veterans are climbing is a clear indication that they are not getting the services and supports that they need. A Green Government will step up to provide long overdue comprehensive services for veterans. We will provide support for all veterans, including disabled veterans, that allow them to live in dignity. Ensure that services to veterans and their family members are fully integrated and funded. Launch a national re-examination of veterans issues in December 2019 based on good faith engagement with military families and veterans, including issues relating to pensions and benefits. The goal is to identify necessary reforms and changes to programs to better meet veterans' needs. In the meantime, restore periodic payments to veterans at pre-2006 levels. Repeal the section of the Superannuation Act that denies the pensions to surviving spouses of certain workers, including RCMP and veterans who married after 60 years old. Work with veterans organizations to review and update the Veterans Charter and the process's structure and mandate, the, mandate of the Veterans Review and Appeal Board to ensure all veterans are treated fairly and with respect. And finally, ensure that all veterans have access to health care, mental health support, and treatments. Military personnel with PTSD must be treated as highly valued people whose health needs need to be restored rather than liabilities who need to be removed. Thank you. The Liberal government reopened all of the nine veteran affairs offices closed by the Conservative government under Harper. The Liberal government delivered $5.6 billion in new financial resources for veterans and their families, including increasing the disability award to a maximum of $360,000 indexed to inflation. This means more money in the pockets of all of our vets and injured, in, ill and injured vets, increasing the earning loss benefit to 90% of the veterans pre-salary release. Indexed inflation, this ensures those undergoing rehabilitation have the financial support they need during their recovery. Implementing personalized assessments for the permanent impairment allowance will ensure veterans are more appropriately compensated for the impact of a service-related impairment on their career. The benefit will also be renamed the Career Impact Allowance to better reflect the, its intent. We've also increased the amount of the survivor's estate exemption under the funeral and burial program so that veterans are eligible, eligible for a dignified funeral and burial. The Liberal government took significant steps towards delivering a higher standard of service and care for Canada's veterans and hired more than 360 employees to give veterans access to the support that they need. The Liberal government is committed to supporting Canada's veterans, especially those who are ill or injured. It is our responsibility to provide financial security for those who need it. That is why the Liberal government introduced Pension for Life, a monthly payment that will better mean better support for ill and injured veterans. The plan provides tax-free compensation with the choice of monthly payments for life to recognize pain and suffering caused by service-related disability. The plan also provides income replacement for veterans who are experiencing barriers returning to work after military service at 90% of their pre-release salary. And the plan support, the plan service support a wide range of areas including education, employment, physical and mental health. Excuse me, but how can I believe that when you just when the Liberal government just cut back the medical benefits for veterans to have to go to the hospitals? How can I believe that that they they will do that or they've even done it? We got we got a say we had a say in the army It sounds like someone is a babbling brook. They don't know where they're going. Prior preparation prevents piss poor performance, eh? We've got, uh, <laughs> we got another saying too, but I won't tell you what it is. So we have about three minutes left. Um, so we could have time for one more really quick question. How much time do we have? <laughs> Three minutes divided by four. Uh, yeah, I. It's a good question. Um, 
because I've, I've been the candidate before, um, but I've also been the person that represents uh, Chowend in the riding. And I know how much work it takes. Uh, people say that we get to travel. I say we have to travel, travel back and forth from to and from Ottawa every week. And it's the reason why we do that is so we're, we, we represent your interests in Ottawa, but we also are here for your needs locally. And I'll just use this as an example. We have four offices total in the riding. And what is, why do you, why does, should I care about that? Because that's where you come in and if you have a need, whether it's CRA or you need a passport or you have an immigration issue or you have any issue for that matter, even if it's provincial, we listen to you and we'll get you the help that you need, whether you're a veteran, any, all 110,000 people that I represent in this riding, we have an open door. If you need us, we're there to help you with whatever that issue is. And so it's being a representative on both of those fronts and doing it diligently. Sometimes you get four, three, four hours sleep a night because you need to be somewhere uh, and you only have that much time to sleep. You do it because you care about your constituents. And uh, I'd like to say my record stands for itself. I haven't been perfect, there's no question. But I certainly try hard to represent you well and I'll keep doing that if you reelect me after October 21st, thank you. <coughs> Um, well, basically, uh, I've, when you look at Ottawa, what happens there is kind of an upside down world. And I think the thing that you have to bring into Ottawa is honesty, like true honesty and integrity. And myself, uh, the sacrifice I've made to make this run is uh, pretty tremendous, actually. I'm losing twenty-five to $30,000 out of my pocket to do it. I've been living in my camper van since August. Uh, I've gone and put up videos. You got to see my videos on Caribou Recovery, on Agenda 21. Go look up. The world won't be the same. Uh, I've stuck my neck out. Uh, I have a total understanding now of what you folks have gone through, you veterans. When you went and, and you put your life on the line, I, I put myself on the line big time to do what I'm doing right now. I'm talking about things that aren't being talked about in Canada. UNDRIP is going through and it's, it's going to be in place right away. And I'm the only person who's talking about it. Uh, when I go and talk in, in the different communities and whatnot, it's, it's like silence, especially when it comes to the people in the know of it. Uh, so I cannot do any more than what I, possibly, what I have done already. Uh, and so it's a full total commitment. And um, I don't know, uh, what more can a person do? And, and so I'm a person just like you who's uh, fed up and I never wanted to become a politician. And I still don't want to become a politician. I'm a Canadian patriot. And, uh, and I really believe that Canada is at the precipice at this point in time. And unless we do something uh, substantial, we're going to lose the country that we grew up in. And so that's my directive. And you, if you see my videos, you'll see the whole scenario there. So check me out. Just go on YouTube, search Ron Valent, or you can go PPC in a space in Ron V. And uh, there you can, it's a People's Party of Canada channel, but it's just me. And there, if you click on that, you see all the different videos. And please check it out. I come from a background of community development for the last 20 years, asking people what it is that they need and helping them find the resources for it. So it's not about handing over a fish, but actually teaching them to fish. I'm here for my children's future. I <clears throat> grew up in the North. I was born and raised in the North. And I love the North. I've lived here all my life and I don't plan on leaving here. I ran for the Liberal Party because of all the progress that they've made in the last four years. I think that they've done more in the last four years than any government has done in a really long time. I also wanted to run for the Liberal Party because I think our girls and our daughters need to know that it's okay to run for government positions and be a woman. And so I think it's good role modeling. I think I do have a good, strong voice for the North and I know a lot of people and I've worked basically throughout BC and across Canada and I think that a background in law is an extremely excellent uh, background to have for politics in Canada. And that wraps up our evening. So again, thank you so much everybody for coming out and thank you to everybody for coming up. <laughs>